So my group has been really very interested in, in developing new catalysts and new reactions for a long time. Um, but before we talk specifically about the, the oxidative transformation that, that are really very recently developed, I wanted to give you some idea about uh, what motivates us and how we've been thinking about uh, this chemistry in the, in the last year, year and a half. Um, so certainly there's no doubt in our mind that um, complex structures have been for some time extremely attainable through total synthesis. Um, and really over the last hundred years, uh, you know, organic chemists uh, as a community have developed some very powerful uh, technologies, very powerful strategies um, that have allowed us to make these molecules. And, and um, you know, one of the, I think, uh, incredible accomplishments is this uh, Esai and Company's collaboration with the Kishi Group uh, to be able to synthesize a molecule as complex as uh, uh, aribulin, um, a 62-step synthesis, and, and to be able to make enough of this to actually bring it to market, to bring it, bring it to the clinic. Um, but I think if we look at ourselves really carefully, we also have to acknowledge that there are a number of very complex molecules that are clinically relevant, and Taxol and artemisinin and, uh, certainly fall into this uh, category, where uh, our technology, the, the reactions and the strategies for synthesis we have at our disposable, um, can't compete with nature and, and perhaps wouldn't yet allow us to actually bring these to market uh, if we had to rely on total synthesis. So certainly from the perspective of, of complexity and, and just efficiency, uh, we have a long way to go before we can address all the problems and all the complexity that, that we'd like to be able to. If we look at complexity and efficiency from a, a different perspective, um, and here my group was uh, really, um, uh, certainly this, this review, this perspective from Mike Crochet's group, uh, talking about um, the, the amount of waste that we generate as synthetic chemists, particularly as we start to, to build more and more complex molecules. Um, this is another really, uh, you know, factor in efficiency that we need to address moving forward. So both from the perspective of being able to build complex molecules in very intuitive, very simple ways, and from the, the perspective of being able to build these more complex molecules uh, like pharmaceuticals in a way that doesn't uh, contribute significant quantities of waste to the environment, uh, both of these inspire us to, to develop new reactions and, and new catalytic processes. Um, so in thinking about both of these things, um, certainly in the, the last 18 months, my group has been uh, thinking a lot about oxidative coupling, thinking about how you take a CH bond uh, and couple it oxidatively with another CH bond or an NH bond or an OH bond. And in ideal circumstances, drive these reactions with O2 as the terminal, react, uh, uh, terminal oxidant, clipping the two functional groups together uh, and spitting out water as the only stoichiometric byproduct. Um, the chemistry I'm going to talk to you about today is, is uh, inspired by this concept. It, it's a step, I think, in the right direction. Um, but we're certainly not quite there yet, and we're not going to get to the point about talking about uh, aerobic uh, coupling just yet. But certainly oxidative CH functionalization is something we've been very focused on. So in this general scheme, um, uh, there are sort of two approaches we've taken. And, and one is imagining new transformations. And, and up the top here, you know, I show uh, what I would consider a complexity generating reaction. If you could take a simple molecule such as ethyl benzene and uh, another simple molecule such as tetrahydrofuran, two activated but very different CH bonds, and couple those together, generating two new chiral centers, uh, you'd certainly generate a lot of complexity in a very efficient manner, a very intuitive manner. Um, and, but, but that's a story for another day, not for today. The other way that I think uh, is very useful to, to consider this is to, um, to reevaluate um, reactions which have been shown time and time again to be strategically important. And certainly allylic substitution was one of those reactions which I think we can all agree is, is strategically very, very important reaction. Um, and so we've been thinking about ways of replacing the allylic substitution reaction with oxidative allylic coupling. So just to highlight that idea that this really is a, a strategically important uh, reaction, there's been an incredible uh, amount of development, incredible number of uh, very important players uh, in developing um, allylic substitution chemistry. And, and as you can see here, these three targets I just show you because they come from three very different uh, families of molecules, diterpenes, polyketides, endoalkaloids. Uh, molecules in many, many different families have all had key steps in their synthesis 
uh, revolving around allylic substitution. So if we could move away from the substitution chemistry and start thinking about allylic CH functionalization, um, then I think we could start to make strides in terms of efficiency, both from a, a reaction uh, a yield perspective, as well as from, from the weight perspective. So as you know, traditionally, um, allylic substitution has come from uh, a pre-oxidized substrate, a leaving group in the allylic position of an olefin. Uh, more recently, people have uh, developed chemistry where they've used either dienes or alenes or alkynes as the pre-oxidized uh, chemistry, again, all to get into this pile intermediate and then to, to conduct uh, the CN, the CO, the CC bond forming step. More recently, Christina White's group uh, developed some really beautiful chemistry where they took terminal olefins and palladium catalysts and were able to get into the pile intermediate um, in an oxidative fashion. Um, couple it again with CO bonds, CN bonds, CC bonds um, to make a, you know, a, a large number of, of uh, really important advances. When you look at this chemistry, the palladium chemistry, it's very, very powerful chemistry. Uh, but as it stands at the moment, the palladium catalysts um, appear to be limited to terminal olefins and the nucleophiles that are used tend to be soft nucleophiles. So the oxygen nucleophiles are carboxylates. The nitrogen nucleophiles have two electron withdrawing groups on it. The carbon nucleophiles tend to be malinate and, and malinate derivatives. Um, so we felt there was really room to, to uh, explore this chemistry uh, and if we could start to uh, do the CH functionalization chemistry on internal olefins and to start to do this chemistry with a wider variety of nucleophiles, then again, uh, we would be providing valuable tools uh, to the synthetic community. So there are a couple of key insights that sort of suggested to us that this might be possible. Um, and the first came from Janine Cossie's group, where she showed that uh, this rhodium CP star precatalyst could activate this terminal olefin. And here the key advance was that it allowed the cyclization of a, a nitrogen nucleophile that didn't have two electron withdrawing groups on it. Um, it was a new catalyst for making the allylic pi -allyl complex compared to the palladium catalysts, um, and it moved the chemistry forward uh, like I said, just opening up, uh, suggesting that it might open up a, a range of nucleophiles. And then the other piece of uh, inspiration, the other thing that really suggested to us that this might be possible to move uh, to an intermolecular functionalization of an internal olefins uh, came from a follow-up piece of work from Tanaka's lab where they were looking at the mechanism of this reaction. And what Tanaka's group showed was that you could take a variation on the rhodium CP star. This is a, a variation on CP uh, that the Tanaka group had developed, the CPE ligand, and that you could take this rhodium CPE uh, precatalyst or, or complex and react it with an internal olefin. And in this case, really excitingly, you could selectively form the internal pi allyl complex over the terminal pi allyl complex. So you were getting selectivity between two different kinds of CH bonds, and you were activating uh, CH bonds from allylic CH bonds from internal olefins. So these two pieces of information really suggested to us that it might be possible to, to develop uh, intermolecular allylic CH functionalization uh, of internal olefins. So um, to jump to sort of our first key results, and this is the work of Jacob Berman in my group, um, we simplified the problem by choosing initially, uh, just to see if the reaction would work, um, a symmetrical uh, allylic olefin, a symmetrical olefin, um, so this diphenylpropene. Um, we used the rhodium CP star catalyst, uh, pre-catalyst, this rhodium CP star dichloride dimer with uh, silver tetrafluoroborate to abstract the chlorides and get us into a cationic complex. We screened a range of oxidants, but quickly found that silver acetate was the most effective for this reaction. Um, and in our first really significant hit, found that you could do this allylic amination in 80% yield using 5% of the catalyst um, with silver acetate as the oxidant. Um, a quick set of control experiments showed that we did in fact need the silver tetrafluoroborate to abstract those chlorides, even though we were using silver acetate as the oxidant. And it's well known in the literature that if you take silver acetate and try and do the exchange with the, the rhodium chlorides to generate the rhodium acetate uh, uh, complex, that this reaction typically takes 24 to 48 hours at elevated temperature. So we think the silver tetrafluoroborate just provides kinetic access to that cationic complex. If you leave out the rhodium altogether, then the reaction is ineffective. And after some further optimization, we were able to show that at one more percent catalyst loading at 40 degrees Celsius in, in uh, dichloromethane, we could isolate 88% of the allylic amination product.
Um, the first thing that we looked at, having shown that the simple tosylamine uh, could act as a nucleophile, was how broad the scope was with respect to the nitrogen nucleophile. Could you alkylate that tosylamine, bring in, start to bring in a means of your choice? And sure enough, simple alkylated tosylamines, tosyl aniline, tosyl benzylamine were all effective. Um, in addition to the tosyl electron withdrawing group, other common protecting groups on nitrogen were also effective. So the nozzle protecting group, uh, the sulfamate ester, the TCES group, um, and CBZ amine were very, very effective nucleophiles. Where this chemistry starts to allow you to push is to build in the amine of your choice. So you can take a simple amino acid, this NCBZ glycine methyl acid, and start to make the bond. The reaction does seem to uh, be susceptible uh, to start to fall off if you get too much steric bulk next to the nitrogen. But even here with glycine, you can actually form this bond, um, albeit in, in reduced yield. So um, having shown that a range of nitrogen nucleophiles uh, were uh, tolerated in this reaction, obviously the real key was to be able to look at regioselectivity. So moving away from that simple diphenylpropene to an aryl alkyl disubstituted uh, uh, olefin, uh, we again find that we do find that the, the reaction is uh, selective um, and we get the conjugated isomer as the major product. The, I, the ratios range from, from moderate, sort of five to six to one, uh, to greater than 20 to one across a range of different aryl groups. What we see is that electron withdrawing groups on the aryl group uh, are well tolerated, so fluorines, chlorines, trifluoromethyl groups, esters, um, and electron donating groups are also well tolerated. So the methoxy uh, aryl groups, the Bach uh, protected anilines, as well as oxidatively sensitive molecules like thiophene uh, and indole are all tolerated in this reaction. I will uh, come back to the, the, the regioselectivity um, a little bit later in this talk, um, uh, particularly the, the sort of outlier result with the fluoro uh, parasubstituted aryl group uh, compared to the chloro and the trifluoromethyl. Okay, um, so as we further started to explore uh, the, the scope and, and the tolerance of this reaction for, for increased steric bulk. If you take the, the reaction, move from a linear chain uh, to a cyclohexyl substituted chain, uh, the reaction uh, proceeds with high yield and, and good regioselectivity. Uh, but as you increase the bulk a little bit further to the terp-butyl group, you now need an elevated temperature, the yield drops off a little bit, and you start to see a, an erosion of the regioselectivity. If you move from the trans disubstituted olefin to the cis disubstituted olefin, it will engage in the reaction, although it does require an elevated temperature of 80 degrees. But what we find is that the olefin actually isomerizes during the reaction, and we only see product the right, uh, the, uh, the trans substituted uh, product coming out of uh, this reaction. All right. So having established that it was possible to do allylic amination under these conditions, we started to ask what other nucleophiles uh, could engage. Um, and so alcohols are common uh, nucleophiles uh, to make ethers and allylic substitution reactions, but they can also be oxidatively sensitive uh, and oxidized uh, by rhodium catalysts. Um, in this case, what we find is that we can indeed uh, selectively do the allylic etherification um, in preference to the allylic oxidation. So again, a range um, of different alcohols are tolerated. Um, of particular note, you can take benzyl alcohol, one which is particularly susceptible to oxidation, um, and this turns out to be a very, very good substrate, um, performing the allylic uh, etherification in very high yield. In addition to the etherification, we can start to look at carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. So turning to the nucleophiles that are most common um, or, or certainly were, sort of were, were uh, present at the start of allylic substitution chemistry, um, melanates and melanate variants uh, will all engage in allylic uh, uh, functionalization, oxidative allylic functionalization. Uh, but probably more interesting to us, moving away from these melanate derivatives, uh, we find that indoles will also uh, engage in this reaction, and we can do oxidative allylic um, arylation with indole substrates. Here we start to see subtle electronic differences. So if we take an indole with an electron donating group or electronically neutral groups on the nitrogen, then we essentially see one-to-one -one mixtures of regioisomers uh, coming out of this reaction. But if we take indoles that have electron withdrawing groups on the nitrogen, so CBZ, the Bach, the tosyl group, then we start to see greater than 21, 20 to 1, almost exclusive selectivity, uh, again, for the conjugated product coming out of this reaction. So 
a little bit more about mechanism. How's this reaction actually working? Um, the first thing that uh, we can tell you is that the allylic CH functionalization under the amination conditions appears to be irreversible. So what Jacob did is he took the, the tosylamine and he deuterated it, um, used deuterated tosylamine in the reaction. He added 10 equivalents of uh, deuteroacetic acid and he ran the reaction to partial completion, isolated both the recovered starting material and the product and saw absolutely no deuterium incorporation in either of them. So it seems that once the, the rhodium has uh, engaged the olefin and done the CH cleavage, uh, that it's committed and product is formed from that. However, the carbon nitrogen bond forming step um, appears to be reversible. So what we noticed in, in the reaction, and this is uh, the parafluoro uh, benz uh, phenyl ring over here, is that if we conducted the reaction at 40 degrees, we actually got about a four to one mixture of the two regioisomers. But if we conducted the reaction at, at, at 60 degrees, then we were seeing close to or greater than 20 to one regioselectivity uh, for the product labeled B uh, in here. So we didn't know if this was a, a, a strange kinetic effect or whether the products were actually able to equilibrate um, under the uh, elevated uh, reaction uh, temperature. So what Jacob did is he set this reaction up, he ran it for 24 hours at 40 degrees Celsius, he pulled an aliquot out of the reaction, and sure enough, what we see um, is this four to one ratio of, of product B to product C, and a little bit of the actual allylic acetate in the reaction at this stage as well, so 10% uh, of the allylic acetate. He then took that reaction mi mixture and heated it up to 60 degrees Celsius, um, and stirred it for an, an, another 24 hours, um, took another aliquot, and now he sees that both the acetate and the minor regioisomer have essentially all converted through to the major regioisomer, showing us that the products can actually re-enter the catalytic cycle uh, and interconvert, and, and that we funnel towards the thermodynamically more uh, uh, stable product in this reaction. Um, with respect to, uh, to, to rates of reaction and, and um, uh, again, probing this reaction a little further, uh, not surprisingly, we find the reaction is first order in rhodium. Um, so you see as you increase the, the concentration of rhodium, uh, you increase the rate of the reaction in a very predictable manner. Um, and then perhaps again, not surprisingly, the reaction is actually inhibited uh, by the nitrogen nucleophile. So in this case, uh, this top reaction, this fast reaction, is actually at the lowest concentration of the CM. And then as we double the concentration and double it again, the reaction becomes significantly slower. The thing that was uh, perhaps most surprising to us, and, and it's striking in this reaction, is that overall, uh, the reaction actually appears zero order. So by the time we've run this reaction out to this final point, uh, at the 0.25 molar concentration, um, this reaction is essentially complete. That's data through to, to about 80% yield. So it's a, a complete reaction. But as you can see, the progress of the reaction uh, it's linear uh, across the entirety of, of the reaction. We're not quite sure how to interpret that right now, but it may be a mass transport uh, uh, phenomenon associated with the insoluble silver acetate um, needing to reoxidize the rhodium and move the, move the reaction forward. So um, our best sort of picture of this reaction right now um, is that the silver tetrafluoroborate abstracts uh, the chlorides from the, the rhodium uh, precatalyst, uh, that we generate uh, a rhodium acetate. We do know, and I didn't show you the data for this, but we do know that the reaction needs to be slightly acidic. An acetic acid is being generated through the, the reaction. If we include a base and mop up the acid, then the reaction does not turn over at all. So we believe the acid is required to, to protonate off the acetate ligand from the rhodium and open up uh, this cationic rhodium uh, species. We know that CBZ will, uh, CBZ amine will bind to the rhodium and pull it off cycle and, and, and uh, sequester it. Um, but if there's cationic rhodium in the, the cycle, uh, then it can engage the olefin, uh, do the CH functionalization and form a pi allyl complex. And we've actually seen this, we've run this re reaction stoichiometrically and isolated these compounds. Um, certainly from here, you can imagine the acetate engaging and forming that, that acetate byproduct we saw in the earlier experiment. Um, or you can imagine the nucleophile of choice, CBZ amine, uh, the alcohols we've been talking about, this, the carbon nucleophiles we've been talking about coming in and forming the bond. 
To date, we don't know if this is an inosphere process uh, or an outosphere attack, and we're working on, on looking at this. And then obviously the silver acetate is in there to reoxidize the rhodium and, and close the circle. Certainly to, to fully understand this, uh, mechanistic experiments are ongoing and, and computation will be needed as well. Um, so with that, I think, you know, what I'd like to share with you today is, is a, a developing um, area of chemistry in our group, a new uh, allylic CH functionalization, an oxidative CH functionalization of internal olefins. Um, I think there's a lot to learn here, a lot to explore, but uh, the potential for a very powerful reaction to emerge. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the, the group of co-workers. You've seen their names uh, at the bottom of the slides. Uh, but in this picture, we have Jacob Berman, Caitlin uh, Farr, uh, Robert uh, Harris, um, Taylor Farmer Nelson, and Daniel Salguero, uh, Salguero uh, all of whom contributed to the work that I've talked about today. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to Hugh, and I know he will be fielding questions. Thank you.